My name's Lee Mullin. Uh, I work for Autodesk. Uh, my role is construction specialist for uh, Northern Europe. Uh, I look after a team in Europe as well for the whole construction workflows area uh, and work with the Middle East team as well. Uh, my background is I joined Navisworks Limited before it was Autodesk. So I joined just over 10 years ago. So hopefully I know Navisworks if nothing else. Uh, I'm based in the UK in a place called Sheffield uh, in the north of England, about 30 miles away from Manchester. Um, and what I'm here to talk about is tips and tricks, things that may help you in your everyday work. So I started a blog with a colleague uh, called Beyond Design uh, about four years ago. Uh, does anyone read this blog? Okay, hopefully after this you will all be reading this blog. Um, so we started this up essentially as tips and tricks for Navisworks and then as um, Autodesk expanded what they were doing uh, in construction over the last two or three years, it's become a much more general um, <coughs> construction blog. Um, one, one of the nice things is we have lots of blogs in Autodesk and this is one of the more popular ones. Uh, it comes behind um, a blog which, uh, by a colleague called Sean Hurley who gets to do all the really, really cool stuff of flying drones in Africa and uh, gets to uh, swim with the corals, so I'm okay being behind that. And there's another blog which does special effects of films, which I'm very happy being behind because that's quite cool. So it's, it's quite a popular blog and we post very regularly um, and it's a whole range of tips um, and it tells you about the new software. Uh, do have a look. If you look beyond Design Autodesk, it should be the top result. Um, so I'm going to do a very, very quick run-through of lots of tips and tricks in lots of bits of software. So my aim from this session is that you all learn at least one thing. I'll ask at the end, if you don't learn one thing, I apologise, I'll spend time with you afterwards until I show you something new. But hopefully you will learn something new during this session. Uh, we're going to cover a whole range of processes from those really early stages of how do you tender and win work uh, right through to um, being able to use your mobile phone for uh, maintenance and operations. So we've got a real mix in here. Um, I'll probably ask if you can save any questions for the end, so if you do need to jot them down because there'll be lots that I'm throwing at you for the next, for the next uh, 50 minutes. So the first area that I'm going to talk about when my slide changes, uh, is business development, so this idea of winning work. And it's a really quick tip and trick. Um, does anyone use A360 rendering? Okay, so this is where from Revit or Navisworks you can upload your model into the cloud and this will create a high quality render for you. Now one of the nice things you can do with this, when my computer catches up, uh, is to be able to create these nice 3D, 3D panoram panoramic renders. This is running a little bit slower than I'd hope. Um, but you can quickly send this up from, uh, from your design package or your review package um, and then create these free, uh, 360 panoramic renders that can be saved as HTML files um, or we can put them onto your mobile phones. And I'm not sure if any of you have seen this, the Google Cardboard. Uh, these are very cheap, they're very cheap to buy. You can buy them from you know, various Amazon stores and you'd normally get them now as free freebies <laughs> at these conferences. You put your mobile phone in, you can now get a stereo render where it has both eyes so it looks like you're in a 3D pan uh, panoramic render of the area that you're going to be working in. So this is a really, really quick way just to impress a client. Um, obviously there's other ways of doing this as well. Um, can I just ask, just so I get an idea of who's in the room, uh, who works for an architect? Okay, so we have a few architects. Who works for uh, m maybe another engineering discipline, uh, structural, MEP, civil, quite a few, okay. Uh, and how many people work at a contractor's? Or project managers, or so somebody who's looking after that side? Okay, it's good to know. So we've got a real mix in here. Uh, so one of the areas that we've also got is this idea of construction modelling. So one of the nice things you can do with um, using Navisworks in conjunction with 
Revit is to be able to identify elements that might need splitting for pouring. So, for example, a pour sequence of concrete. Uh, so you can use quantification in Navisworks to quickly drag and drop the items you are try trying to identify larger parts for. Um, and then from there, select those items and then use the switchback functionality to take you directly back into that same part in Revit. Now, when you're in Revit, whether this be you know, the columns or the floors or whatever you're looking at uh, using, you can isolate those. You can then use the grids uh, or levels as uh, a way of splitting those items up. So you can use all the stuff that should be in the design already to actually help, uh, help identify uh, where you're going to split these, split these uh, floors up. So you can see here we've got some dashed lines, uh, hopefully you can see them, uh, of where we're looking to uh, create those pores. You can then export this back out as an NWC and up update your Navisworks um, live file. Now why would you want to do that? The main reason tends to be to bring it as part of a, um, a construction simulation sequence. So you want to identify you know, which trades are going to be working in certain areas, uh, how, uh, how are these pores going to happen in practice. So this allows you to um, attach those to a task uh, and then just identify that that's going to happen over a certain period. Once those concrete pores are cured, then the other pores can be uh, completed. Okay, interoperability. Uh, now, this is the one word we hear a lot in Europe, and I know it's exactly the same here, where um, Autodesk has been, you know, we've, we've been panned quite a lot for our support for standards like IFC. Now, for those who aren't aware, we've been doing lots of work with IFC over the last three, four years, um, and you, you'll now see we've got an open source exporter for IFC for Revit, uh, partners have worked on developing IFC export from Navisworks as well. So if you look at, I think it's iConstruct, do that as well. And we're supporting it in a whole range of applications. Now, one of the really interesting things is this slide is already out of date. We, about uh, a month ago, added support for IFC in Inventor, which is our manufacturing uh, tool. So you can now get those uh, families out as IFCs to put into other applications. So we have this open, uh, open source IFC exporter you can download uh, either from the App Store or we recommend you go to SourceForge and get it from there because that's the latest version. You can go in and make your own tweaks and modify it to get exactly what you need. Uh, we support a range of standard uh, international standards such as a coordination view, uh, design view and we've got additional ones coming in as well. Um, we support IFC 4, which is the newer version, uh, and that's across different applications again. Um, and that's now starting to be adopted in the industry as, uh, as a standard. And civil. Uh, uh, civil is an area where we don't have any definitions currently for how an IFC should be structured. For example, on a road, where is the space, what is an IFC space? So those are currently being reworked, but in the meantime, we've utilised our IFC exports to allow you to take an IFC directly out of Civil 3D to help with some of those coordination issues you might have. Um, another area we're uh, working in is, and a lot of this comes from the UK mandates, uh, is COBE export. So has anybody in the room been asked for a COBE uh, data drop of anything from their files? Okay, we've got one or two. Okay, so uh, Kobe is essentially a structured, uh, a structured format for the data within a project. Um, typically, you would see this in an Excel format, but it could also be an SQL database. There's lots of other ways as well. Uh, and we've got a Kobe export to allow you to take that out from Revit. But actually, probably more importantly for you guys is the ability to uh, use the model checker, which is, again, another free tool. Uh, just to allow you to identify that the appropriate information is available within the model um, and then uh, when you're doing your Kobe export or just verifying that things are in the correct place uh, you can use this tool as well. Now all of these tools are available from autodesk.com slash IFC. Um, if you've not seen this bit of a website do have a look. Um, we have additional tools which will be going on there very soon as well. So we have a classification manager 
uh, and we also have um, a beta um, which we're looking to put out of Kobe Export for Navisworks. So you're going to see that this, this website expands. Um, I think there's another t uh, a website called BIM Interoperability Tools, which collects them all in the same place. So coordination. Um, from a coordination point of view, who uses Navisworks in the room? Okay. Um, and how many times are you managing hundreds and hundreds of clashes? Yeah. That's what we tend to Yeah, we tend to see. So um, who's aware of BIM 360 Glue? Who's heard of the, the tool? So BIM 360 Glue is based on the same viewing engine, the same clash engine, the same file readers, um, and it does clash detection. So why would you have both? Well, essentially, it's to allow uh, particularly the design teams to do what I'd class as like a spell check on the model before they pass it on. So then they can be identifying their own clashes before it gets to the BIM manager at the end of the week. Now, what we're typically seeing is you'll have a, a coordination meeting, you'll have 150 clashes that week or many, many more. Uh, and from that 150 clashes, you maybe have time to resolve 30 in a two-hour meeting which means you've got 120 clashes left over. So what happens in that 100, you know, with that 120 clashes? Do they go to site or do they delay your design period? Or do you have to just get things out because that's how things work? BIM 360 Glue is intended to be that easy to use, much less buttons, much less complicated, spell check for your design teams to get that 150 clashes down to something more manageable. So maybe you're looking at 50 clashes at the end of the week that you have to prioritise instead of 150. So it's got some really nice tools to allow you to go through the clashes, send them, uh, send them on to uh, various members of the team, do additional markup, um, and it's utilising the good things about the cloud, which is anyone can access it from wherever you are. Uh, you can also view these models on your iPad as well, so it makes it nice and easy to use. Um, it's got, if you see this little um, overview, it will give you an update to tell you, you know, how many of these clashes have been resolved, how many are uh, currently, uh, how many are currently uh, closed, how many uh, are ready for review and resolved. <coughs> Um, we've also got tools to allow you to take your viewpoints from your clashes in Navisworks and push them into this system called Share Views. It's in the latest version of the service pack for Navisworks and it means that you can then uh, you share your clashes that you currently have out with the rest of the team. And just to quickly show you, um, there's a really good connection now between Glue and Navisworks. So it means you can just open those live models. You can create merge models or what you previously consider as your NWFs directly from the design files that are available within Glue. So it just allows you to quickly uh, aggregate your models. It allows you to share information to and fro. Um, and it allows you, you know, hopefully just to be able to make Clash a little bit more manageable because it's not always the easiest thing to do. Um, another thing that we're doing at Autodesk is we're really trying to uh, change the conversation from clash detection, which is trying to find something that's already gone wrong, to making sure it doesn't go wrong in the first place with clash avoidance. So for anybody that uses any of the Auto AutoCAD-based applications, in 2016 you may have seen this, which is a coordination view. This is where you can load the latest live Navisworks or BIM 360 Glue model into AutoCAD. Now this means that you're not working off an XREF that may be three or four weeks old. You're working off yesterday's version. So you're working in a much more real-time uh, real way. Now this also means AutoCAD um, has much improved performance because you've now got what is essentially the Navisworks engine um, <coughs> drawing the bulk of your model whilst AutoCAD is left to do what it's good at, which is design. Okay, so. We're, you know, we're looking to improve the way in which Clash is done. We're looking to make that 150 clashes or more um, not happen quite as much and make it more manageable because you've got a lot of work to do as it is. And you can see you're getting quite good performance um, in AutoCAD, which if you'd said maybe five years ago, uh, I think you would have su surprised quite a lot of people. So the next area I'm going to talk about is quantification. Now, 
quantification is something which typically is the estimators or the quantity surveyors that would look after. But there's many other people within uh, construction and the supply chain and everybody else who needs to understand what's in the model. So this, this is a tool which can be used for the estimators. Uh, but just to show you a quick tip and trick, just to allow you to quickly access quantities in the model. So you can open any of the models, any of your current existing Navisworks models, and literally drag and drop them into the quantification panel. So you can quantify them against a, a standard catalogue, but you could also just literally drag and drop the entire model, and that has quantified the entire model for you. So that's taken with a Revit model, or a DWIF file, or an IFC, that's taken all the standard lengths, volumes, areas, uh, heights, and that's pulled them all together. From there, you can start adding resources to them. So in this case, it could be uh, a, for a wall, how many bricks, how many blocks, how many wall ties, how much insulation. Let's add uh, some waste in there because we know we waste 10% of, um, of our insulation every time that we install it. So you can start adding uh, a much more a, a very, a, you can very, very quickly get access to all these quantities and very, very quickly get an idea of how many bricks are we going to use in total on this project? Um, how many uh, wall ties are we going to need to use? How many hangers are we going to have to put in? Um, and it allows you to very quickly access the information that you've already got within these models. That's kind of the point of BIM. <laughs> um, how do you access the information? And obviously, you know, we, we don't just work in the world of 3D, we also work with 2D as well. And from a contractual side, uh, often, you'll see, um, often you'll see 2D is still the way in which we work. So to add confidence to how you're working between 2D and 3D, uh, it's really easy to switch between them in Navisworks. Um, not many people actually know we do 2D in Navisworks. Who did, who did know? We have 2D. Okay, so there you are. Some people here have learned something today, so that's good. So what we can do is we can load in 3D model, we can load in 2D sheets, um, we can load in PDFs, uh, but ideally you want to work with DWIF uh, or DWIFX files because they give you the most intelligence. Then you can select an item in the 3D model or in the 2D sheet and find that in any of the other sheets or find that within the 3D model. So it allows you to quickly cross-reference um, against different items. So if you think about from a quantification point of view, you want to verify, you want to double check that the um, 3D quantity you've been given from the model is the same as what the, uh, Q, the estimator would measure uh, from their 2D sheet and it allows you to do that. So yeah, so that's something which may be worth uh, picking up and having a look at. Um, Model validation. So this allows you to. Oh, I'll just wait for the slide to move again. There we go. So model validation. So this is where maybe you're looking at clash detection. Maybe you're looking at information within the model. Now, one of the most powerful ways to do that is to use a thing called search sets. Um, I want to just show you a quick way to create search sets because I know that's one thing. Whenever I go anywhere, people find this really, really hard work or difficult to do. So. Hopefully, if nothing else, this is the one thing which will, uh, which will help you in Navisworks. So in the selection tree, you have a little drop down. And one of the things you can select there is properties. Now, all of these properties are pre-created search sets. So this is looking for, for example, uh, all of the family names uh, of a particular type, uh, all of the level one items. Um, it's looking for those, those items which have those properties available. So what we can do is we can literally take one of these, copy and paste it, and bring it across into the sets window, which is kind of like your favorites, uh, the things that you want to keep, keep coming back to. And this allows you to then go into clash detection easily, or go into Timeliner, or go into any of the other tools and do those kind of things. Now, sometimes you want to have a more complex search set. So this allows you to take the floor and level two and uh, multiply them together. So essentially you're saying, I just want all of the, all of the level two floors. So what we've done here is we've selected, uh, we've selected both of those existing search sets and then just changed one of the parameters in the find items to be and instead of or, um, and then saved a new search set from there. So hopefully that will allow you to quickly get the search sets that you need 
we are working on tools to make help, perhaps make it a little bit easier as well. Um, I know in the last presentation, anybody who was here to watch the WSP presentation, there was talk of having templates. Now, one of the things I always recommend is you have, if you know your files are coming from Revit, you know that you're having certain families come through, you know that you're using certain levels. You can create these, save these, and bring them into the next project. Um, from a planning and logistics point of view, I've got a couple of things that I want to show you here because this, this is one of the areas that's really, really underutilised because there's a lot of power in this. So you're probably aware that you can connect your pro program schedule from, say, Primavera or Microsoft Project or Asta into Navisworks with your 3D model. Um, a lot of people do this for the purpose of trying to win work, but not many people do this for continuing uh, progress monitoring. Now, one of the nice things you can do with, um, has anyone heard of BIM 360 Field in the room? Okay, uh, we've got an upcoming webinar about that, Hanny will be able to tell you. Um, but this is, this is a, a tool which allows you to do snagging, it allows you to get documents to the field, but it also allows you to do commissioning against objects. So you can start collecting maybe serial numbers, warranty information, but it could also be progress information on a model object. So here we've got, for example, we're using field on the iPad, out on site, to collect the latest progress information. This is then associated with a model object, which then allows you to, um, it then, allows you to then do a colour profile or identify that within the timeline of schedule. Now, if we have time, uh, anybody who does know me knows I'm a bit of a Star Wars geek. So I've got a video right at the end to hopefully be able to show you how this can work in practice. Um, so hopefully we'll have time, so I'll try and be quick. Um, but it allows you to then bring that progress information back into, back into the model. Now, to be able to create this schedule in the first place is something that's often seen as quite cumbersome. Uh, it doesn't have to be. Again, using search sets, you can use your search sets, drag and drop them into the order of your tasks, and maybe use these as ta create your search sets with task names, and then use the auto add uh, all tasks from the sets. You've created an instant model schedule, model based schedule. You can then export this out and view, view this in Primavera or Asta or Project, then build it out in that application to allow you to add resources, uh, costs, any of those additional things which will help you do a more thorough plan. So rather than maybe starting with a plan and then retrospectively having to try and make it work with a 3D model, you can use those early stage 3D models to allow you to start building your plan. Um, another tool we've got is a tool called InfraWorks. Uh, has anyone used InfraWorks? Has anyone seen InfraWorks? Now this is fantastic for construction because what this allows you to do is this allows you to maybe rather than spending um, you know, a certain amount of money on creating a 3D model, you can use Model Builder to within 15 minutes create a 3D model which contains uh, up to 200 square kilometres of aerial imagery, terrain, uh, nearby buildings, roads, uh, and in this case obviously we're taking some of, uh, some of the nearby area. Uh, I didn't realise that that's actually being built on right now, the area which I've taken for this. Uh, but what this allows you to do is create this 3D model and then you can start using it for a whole bunch of reasons. In this case we're going to show, um, that seems to have frozen. Or is that completed the video? No, okay. I thought I'd sped that up, so that's my mistake. Right, here we go. So we're now downloading the latest version of the model. This is taking any of the building information that's available. If you have any shape files which show the nearby buildings, you can bring those in as well. Uh, it brings in lots of different data formats, Revit models, IFCs. And then we can start using it just to quickly start sketching what our construction site's going to look like. So we can uh, identify, for example, which areas you're not going to be able to walk in because there's going to be machinery there. It uh, allows you to start putting in, for example, your barriers to make sure you've got the appropriate uh, security <laughs> around the site. And within, what, half an hour, you very quickly, ra rather than sketching it on a 2D plan, you've got a 3D model you can then use to show you know, what, what we're working on. You can start adding 3D content, so in this case we've got cranes, we've got trucks, we've got some materials. Anything you can turn to an FBX file, 
you can bring into this application to start um, to start put, putting in, for example, toilets, site cabins, uh, any of that additional items as well. Um, if you're using it for a master planning purposes, you can do it for that as well. If you've got your design model, you can use that as well. So it allows you to really, really quickly build out a site model. Now, what you can then do is export that out as an FBX and then create uh, a construction simulation based on the actual schedules. So in this case, we've linked all these to a particular period and you can see just how the different phases of a construction plan are going to work. So it allows you to fairly quickly, um, you know, fairly quickly show your intent that you're going to work on that site. Um, temporary works. Who works with temporary works? Who touches temporary works? Okay. So this might go, be a mute point, but I'll just um, show here. So one of, one of the things that we've seen more and more is people modelling temporary works. Um, there's lots of reasons why you can do this. So to give you an example, this is where we've taken a scaffold and we've done a structural analysis on it. Um, it could be a wind analysis, it could be any of those areas where you're just making sure that there's not going to be problems on site, there's not going to be health and safety issues. Um, we can also use this on site to then start quantifying it. So the site manager can make sure that they have the appropriate amount of, um, appropriate amount of materials um, on site before trying to erect a scaffold. So you can do again this drag and drop which will show you how many spindles you've got, how many pipes you need, uh, how many uh, batten boards you've got as well. Um, you can also use it for example for layout. Um, temporary works tend to be very sensitive, they tend to need to a high level of accuracy. So has anyone heard of point layout? <coughs> okay. If you haven't and you do any level of layout or you want to verify as built information from others, uh, I recommend you go to uh, Hanny's session at 2 o'clock. He's just at the back if he wants to give a wave. Yeah, it's, the, uh, it's actually a hands-on session at the admin portal. You'll uh, experience the software yourself. There are simply some sizes that you've gone through it. And it's a cook in a dimension. And it's an optimum yeah. yeah. So it's the same place where you have the uh, optimum seven. Yeah, so, so yeah, so it allows you to then do accurate layout. And you can do accurate layout from Revit, from AutoCAD, or from any of your Navisworks uh, tools as well. So it allows you to bring in models from anywhere. It doesn't have to be our, it doesn't have to be our design um, applications. It could be from anywhere. Um, one of the nice things about this is if you think about uh, a traditional construction site, people will have very big, hard, hard uh, heavy wearing tablets that they're working in 2D to do their layout. Uh, we've introduced a tool to allow you to bring a 3D model to site and have a much better connected workflow between uh, the points that you want to lay out um, and bringing that as built information back in to either correct uh, to either correct your model or to redesign if necessary. Um, and then from there as well you might want to do things like uh, the construction simulation uh, or clash detection to make sure that those will all work in time. Now talking about clash detection this is one of the more advanced workflows that is actually quite easy to do. Uh, this is where we're basically bringing in uh, a piece of equipment, in this case an escalator, and we want to verify that it's going to fit in appropriately with the 3D model. Or oh, this could be a laser, a laser scan. Um, and essentially what this allows you to do is to run through and create an animation of a moving object, link this to the schedule so you can make sure, for, uh, make sure that, for example, it's not going to interfere with other trades or other pieces of uh, equipment, for example, some temporary works that are there uh, for that particular period. And then run a clash detection. So you can then identify if this is going to clash, where is it going to clash and when. So then we can go and either change the schedule or we can move items and add tempor you know, temporary supports. Or we can look at bringing in a different piece of equipment which would fit into that space. So it allows you to use it in a much more powerful way. Um, and obviously this can then be sent out as a report um, um, or you can just send out the file which has all the information available in there as well. Now one, we've taken this one step further and uh, who's aware of photogrammetry? So essentially that's where you're taking lots of photos and creating a 3D model based on those photos. So what we can do is we can take, um, so in this case, this example, I'll apologise, I only took about 20 photos 
in reality you want to take uh, 40 plus photos of an object take one or two measurements of that object and then it goes into the cloud creates a 3d model and then that 3d model you can then bring back into in this case navisworks and do exactly the same thing and you'd then be able to run through through that same time-based clash so rather than maybe spend having somebody spend a day doing modeling they can just take a bunch of photos uh take a bunch of photos and uh, create a 3d model from there which then allows you to do that clash detection there's a whole bunch of ways that could be used um, one of the other things that we've done over the last year is we've allowed you to, on the fabrication side, we've done lots of work in fabrication, both structural fabrica fabrication uh, and in this case MEP <coughs> fabrication. Um, for anybody that's using any of the fabrication products, you can now bring your fabrication parts into Revit. Um, now this obviously allows a much smoother workflow. <laughs> it allows you to maybe do your clash detection a little bit easier as well uh, and design against, you know, the. the uh, designer against the various other trades. So we're doing lots of work in this area. If you look at advanced steel as well, this is one of those areas where we're looking at making that design um, flow into that construction ready design. Um, so then in this case we can take that fabricate those fabrication parts, we can send them off to a nesting service to optimize material usage. Um, and then this will create obviously your shop drawings to then um, take these out to site. Uh, now one of the things you can do now with the fabrication parts is we've got this full end-to-end -end workflow where you can barcode these items, take them all the way onto site, scan the barcode and then it'll come up with the relevant checklists, um, it'll come up with the relevant documentation and it allows much easier, um, a much easier uh, installation out on site. Um, one of the big growing trends we're seeing is generally an off-site manufacture. Um, so we're seeing more and more people using manufacturing techniques in construction and essentially assembling buildings rather than building them. Um, obviously with so many high-rises in Dubai, that's one of the, one of the uh, areas that's really of interest. Now, here we've got... Um, let's wait for this to load. Uh, here we've got a manufacturing-ready uh, drawing from Inventor. Now, to bring that into Revit, you're going to find real performance issues. That's going to give you real problems. So we've got tools in Inventor to simplify these models to allow you to then go into Revit uh, and use them in a much more lightweight, easy manner. Uh, so what we, what we do is we've got um, a BIM toolbar within Inventor, and this allows you to uh, fill any of the voids, so any of the holes that are in there, which might not be important for the purpose of um, you know your Revit coordination um, and then be able to remove any of those additional details so rather than having that complex item you've got a much more simplified item so that it would then allow you to do your coordination to make sure that joints match up but then you don't have all of the additional heavy uh, geometry which would uh, give you problems in Revit. Um, on the field execution side now as, as you're not aware of uh, BIM 360 field this is just a quick screenshot to demonstrate uh, what we have in there, but if you're doing your snagging, what we typically see is people go onto site and they may. Do any of you guys go on site? A show of hands. Okay. Um, how often do you see someone going around with a notepad and a digital camera and doing their snagging that way, and then going back into the office and then tying up those photos, which we've got to remember which order they're in, tying up those photos uh, with those notes, then sending an email off which is fine, it works, but it's probably not the best way to do it. it double handling information, you may be spending an extra two hours in the office at the end of the day when you could be going home and uh, having a nice, a, a nice, um, a nice meal. Uh, what BIM 360 Field allows you to do is to do all of your snagging on the iPad whilst you're out on site. Then when you go back to the office, it's simply a, press, a case of pressing sync, which pulls all the information uh, pulls all the information that you've collected on site up to the cloud uh, and sends off the relevant alerts and emails to those teams. So when they come in the following day, they've got a list of their issues they need to resolve. Now, the tip here, which um, you know might not be as relevant if you're still using uh, notepads and cameras, uh, but we've got a thing called templates, which allows you to say, here are um, the most common issues, here are the things which we see time and time again. 
Now, rather than typing these out every single time, we can create these templates which allow you to, uh, every single time we have the HVAC and we have uh, a grill installation that's not flush, rather than typing in for two minutes and taking a photo, we can press two buttons, bring us to that, uh, bring us to that particular issue, and then take a photo to demonstrate maybe mark that up at the same time. And that's taken something which may have previously taken two minutes of note capturing the issue with your notepad, um, and then another two or, two or three minutes back in the office of typing that up. That's brought that down to maybe a 30 second process. So it's speeding, speeding up the way you work. Um, layout and verification is something that we've been uh, getting very involved in over the last year and a half. So typically, if you think how Autodesk was involved with construction, it stopped when people pressed print. That's, that's often where Autodesk's involvement in construction stopped. Now we're doing quite a lot uh, in the layout area to allow you to create points of where things should be, uh, send them to your total station, allow you to then lay them out against, uh, in real life, um, and then bring them back to compare to uh, your model so you can verify that the as built are correct. Now, one of the quick, easy ways to do that is to add points in Revit or in Navisworks. Now, say for example, you've got uh, 600, uh, 600 particular items that need laying out one day. Do you want to go in and add a point for every single one of those 600, or do you want to add it to your Revit family? So, what you can do is you can add uh, a layout point to your Revit family. This doesn't have to be visible in all views, um, and then this can be brought through to your total station. So you can save this and embed, you can embed the idea of how this is going to be constructed in the way you're designing. So it allows a much better process. Um, one of the other things, uh, Hanny, are you going to be showing um, BIM 360 layout? No. No. Okay. No problem. <laughs> Not a problem. So BIM 360 layout is the, the tool I mentioned earlier to allow you to bring your 3D model uh, out onto the site. One of the proof of concept workflows we've been working on recently with uh, some of our partners, hardware partners, Topcon and Leica, is how do, we, how do we make this more relevant? How do we make this more real? So one of the things we've been looking at is how you can bring in a point cloud onto your iPad to then do layout against layout against reality as opposed to the design intent, which may be wrong. Uh, how often do you update your drawings from what's actually been built on site, and how often do you just write notes? So this could allow someone to go in, maybe do a scan of this room, um, and then bring in the design intent of their HVAC, um, and then lay out that against what's actually there, as opposed to maybe a model which might be out of date. Um, and um, that's possible to, to do today. Um, another area we've got is uh, machine guidance. So even on a building project, whether you're civil or building, if you're doing building projects, you will have some level of road, roads to do. Uh, we've got a tool, you'd need to get it from one of the country kits in Civil 3D that's based in Northern Europe, but you can download those and have those alongside your current country kits. But it allows you to create joined up strings which can go directly into machine control. So again, this allows you just to more easily take that design information that's been created and push that into the machines that are going to be doing the work. Um, and here's another quick one for, uh, to help you with verification. We've got a big pile of dirt. How much dirt do we have? Um, we can use laser scans to allow us to then um, identify the volumes within that pile. Um, so this is showing in Civil 3D just for how you can do this. Again, this is all these videos, if they're not available on YouTube, they will be soon. Uh, so it's got a step-by-step -step process of how to take that laser scan, create surfaces, and then work out the difference between those surfaces, uh, which will then allow you to work out how, you know, how, how many trucks are we going to need to move this. Okay. Uh, I'll skip through because so, we're... Uh, be able to fit Star Wars in at this rate, so I'll be quick. So, um, anybody who is anybody aware of like any of us that's doing lean construction? So, has anyone seen this before where you've got the uh, post it notes up on the wall? So, they're doing like a pull planning session saying, Before I can do my piece of work, I need you to have done this and this. 
Um, this is how it's done pretty much all over the world. Um, perhaps it might, might be done in Excel, but actually most of the time it's done on post-it notes on a board, which is fine until it gets windy. Uh, and then you've lost all, your, all of your work. We've got a tool we released this year which allows you to digitise that process. So it means anybody on the web or anybody from their iPad can start adding their dependencies on other people's work and then can start tracking, uh, tracking what's being done. Um, it also allows you to do root cause analysis, so it allows you to do reporting that you never would have been able to do from post-it notes. So um, that's a new area we've got there. Um, from an administration side, um, obviously this is this is quite a big one. How do we manage all of uh, how do we manage all of those issues that we've previously been emailing uh, with our photos and our uh, notepad notes? What we can do is if we're creating this information on the iPad, it's already digitised, so we can now start sending out these reports, which can be really powerful. Because in this case, we've got an issue, we've got information about where this issue is. We've got a photo with markup to show what the issue is. We can send these out on an automated basis every day, every week. Um, we can send them proactively uh, rather than wait until there's a problem. Uh, so this means all of the subcontractors can receive a report on a Monday morning of all the issues they have to fix this week, which is quite powerful, particularly if you put that into a leak table, which we can do from the automated reports. Uh, Certain contractors don't like being bottom of league tables, so it's quite a nice way to enforce uh, positive behaviours. Um, and you can also start tracking the number of people that you have on site, the work that's being done, uh, and all these can again be automated as reports back to, uh, back to head office if it's back in the UK or if it's somewhere in Italy. You can be doing this proactively rather than reactively on a Friday afternoon, when, or on Thursday afternoon, say, when you want to go home. Um, right, has anyone heard of Project Alexandria? Okay, so Project Alexandria is uh, something which we uh, announced about two or three months ago. We announced the official name at Autodesk University two weeks ago in Las Vegas called BIM 360 Docs. Now, this is going to change the way you do document management, whether you're in construction, architecture, civil engineering, whatever you're working in. Um, this is going to allow, version con uh, allow you to do version control, do 2D and 3D files uh, with more intelligence, uh, uh, allow you to add uh, various permissions in a cloud-based environment. So sign up on bin360.com slash docs, have a look on there, uh, sign up to it and we'll give you access. We're allowing a phased access over the next, uh, next few months and then that will be launched again fairly soon. Um, handover. So, Handover. How do people do handover at the moment? Do many people do it as big bits of paper documents? So have we started digitising that? Yeah. Um, one of the things we're noticing is people are wanting to collect the information at the point of commissioning, and then they're also wanting to push that information out into a facilities management system or a lightweight maintenance system, or in the UK, and we're starting to see in the Middle East um, this uh, tool called... Well, this... Um, thing called Kobe, and Kobe is again this spreadsheet. So one of the tools which we've put on the blog, on the Beyond Design blog, um, is where we're using uh, Dynamo to be able to get the information you've got from site and map it to the correct fields you'll need for a Kobe export. Now this is more a case of demonstrating that Dynamo isn't just for fancy designs, it's not just for creating those crazy facades. Uh, Dynamo is essentially a visual programming language that allows you uh, visual programming that allows you access to the Revit APIs in a much more straightforward manner. So what we've got here is we've got a script that allows you to take some parameters from one place, take an Excel spreadsheet of where we want to move them to, and then move them and do that in an automated manner. So uh, in this case we've got some parameters that we've pulled down from the 360 field and we're just going to reshuffle them into the Revit, uh, the correct Revit parameters. Um, in this case, this is for Kobe fields, this could be for any data fields. So if you need to remap parameters, uh, download this from the blog uh, and then just put in your parameters you want to move to and from. So it allows you just to really, really quickly work with those. Just wait for that to load. And you'll see here we've got the Kobe information and the BIM 360 information has been populated in the correct place. Many people are using Dynamo to also help with things like sheet naming. 
um, templates, help setting up various uh, standards, identifying uh, maybe rooms that are over a particular area. Uh, they're using it for lots of those automation tasks as opposed to just for design tasks. <coughs> so let's say uh, we've used the iPad out on site to uh, ins install that diffuser. That's got serial numbers associated with it, warranty information, um, and we've got documents associated with it as well. What good is that if it stops at the point of, we've finished construction, now we're going to hand you a load of paper manuals. Um, we've got a, a, a new app, it's a uh, free app to download, obviously you pay for it the more you use, uh, but an app called Building Ops. So what it allows is that commissioned item that you've uh, commissioned out on site, you can then push to your mobile phone. You can then set up proactive maintenance tasks to say, every six months we need to check this air diffuser, this air diffuser. We can then start, um, um, it, as a client you could say, well this, this particular item isn't working or something's too cold. The maintenance guy can then use their iPad, um, iPhone to view the information about that diffuser, make sure they have the right tools before they go out onto site. Uh, and this is changing the way in which people are doing their, uh, doing their handover because it allows them to have a much more so soft handover and work more closely with the data they've already collected. Right, we're, we're approaching the end now, which will be good because we're um, obviously it's near, nearly food time. Um, so we've got a couple of areas here where you might have s some existing buildings and you're doing some work. Um, one of the nice things you can do with point layout is it allows you to pull in as-built information and create a model from that. So here we've got some of these items that have already got these points on the families. And what we can do is we can quickly create a 3D model based on the actual locations of uh, the as-built information that's been created out on site. So in this case, we've got, uh, we're going to have some walls, we're going to have some duct fittings, um, and it allows you just a really, really quick way to be able to generate a 3D model with my as-built information. <coughs> so obviously it'll need some tidying up, but it gets you 80% of the way there which maybe saves you working off various surveyor drawings or 2D drawings that have been created and then turning them into 3D and it allows you just to work in a, maybe a more <coughs> organised manner. Yeah, I can add here, oh, sorry. Yeah, no, you're okay. Session, actually, you learn how to do the slide, so there are some certain examples to create the models from the as built points. So if you're interested, uh, please uh, attend this hands-on session. No problem. So yeah, so that's about 55 minutes, so <laughs> I'd better hurry up. So. Uh, one of the other nice things with the clash detection is you don't just have to clash against physical objects. If you're doing laser scanning on site, you can do uh, what are essentially called clearance clashes, where you're looking to see uh, if your point cloud comes within uh, any of your mod uh, anywhere near your model. Now, what, what, this is, what this allows you to do is to see if your new piece of work is going to fit. Um, maybe if you've um, had one trader's gone in and done their work, you can then take a laser scan and then compare that to the new piece of design work. Do we need to modify the design to allow that next trade to work appropriately? So this allows you, again, just to, just to be able to uh, identify any potential issues before you get to site, because it costs a lot more when you get to site. Right, and I did promise you some Star Wars, so I've, I've got two slides about Star Wars. So one of the other nice things that you've got in point layout, um, if I can forward that, uh, one of the other nice things you've got in point layout is it allows you to compare a laser scan to a surface. So you can then start identifying heat maps of, uh, you know, heat maps of what's gone wrong. Now, hopefully some of you guys will recognise what this is. Yeah. Millennium Falcon. Oh. <laughs> so what we've got here is we've got a, we've got a laser scan of a particular area uh, and we've got the model. And what we're going to do is we're just going to, this is just a bit of fun, this isn't obviously real because I don't have a Millennium Falcon handy. Um, <laughs> But this allows you to do essentially a heat map of how far away these points are from the surface. So what we can do is we can set up a scale, we can use the analysis tools to identify that. Uh, and then obviously just hide the items we don't want to see just so we can identify um, what's, been, what's been going on. Uh, we can set a tolerance to this as well so we can look for any items that are within a certain tolerance. Um, what you'll see when we hide this is that somebody was having a bit of a run around in the corridors of Millennium Falcon. And I don't know if anyone will recognise that. 
in his carbonite. Yeah. <laughs> um, what actually happened is we were building the Death Star and he was running a bit too fast and ran into the wall. So, um, so it allows you to get a really, really quick heat map and then obviously this could be sent out as documentation, could be sent out to do some remedial works. And then one last Star Wars one, and this is the last main slide we have. Uh, and this is showing the progress tracking. Um, so does anyone recognise this? This would be the cockpit of the uh, Millennium Falcon. And what we've done is we've installed uh, various um, uh, cockpit units within here. And what, we, what we're going to do is we're going to pull down the information that's been collected in the field on your iPad. Uh, and that information is available within the model. And then what we're going to do is we're going to use a thing called the Appearance Profiler within Navisworks. And what this allows you to do is this allows you to change the colours of uh, groups of items. So in this case, we're using search sets to then say, I'm going to have to try and read what we have here, uh, which, which ones have been ordered from the uh, corrupted trader, which ones haven't yet been installed by um, <laughs> various other people. But it allows you to get a very quick visual indication of the statuses and the progress of information from site. Uh, which means when you, when you then go into Timeliner with your fully updated construction schedule, you can see, well, these items haven't yet been delivered and we're meant to be installing them next week. Do we need to change our schedule or do we need to ring, uh, ring our um, supplier to say these need to be on site tomorrow, otherwise we're going to have to stop work? So it allows you to start working in a more intelligent way with that. So with one minute to spare, which obviously doesn't leave much time for questions. Um, that's the end of my presentation. But the only question I have to ask, is there anybody here who didn't learn anything today? Right, in, my, in, which, in which case, hopefully I've succeeded. Um, if you did learn something, you know, please go on the design, uh, Beyond Design blog. Uh, we're obviously regularly updating on there as well. There's obviously a whole bunch of tips that are in there as well. If there are any questions, Feel free, otherwise I'll be around for the rest of the day, feel free to ask. Thank you.